Please be seated. Please be seated. Our, our scripture reading is in Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. Chap, uh, Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to, unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And ye shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and bitter herbs, and they shall eat it. Eat none of it raw, nor sodden or all of it with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it. With your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Amen. Oh, I'm sorry, to 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood... I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Amen. Well, thank you all for wearing your uh, VBS shirts this week as we bring to a close the uh, Vacation Bible School theme out of Exodus. We might look at a couple of these lessons further on downstream. There's some wonderful thoughts there. But uh, today, I uh, want to pick up on lesson two of the week on the subject of the Passover and make the application to our own hearts and our knowledge and our understanding of that of our own salvation, going back to the cross and, and building our lives on that blessed truth. Let's pray and we'll look at the Word of God. So, Father, once again today, as we have, we've opened up the Scriptures we know that they've been divinely inspired, carefully written, orchestrated, and supervised. They are here to us and are for our admonition, for our instruction. Help us, our God, to be able to uh, grasp the, the truth, the significance, the, uh, and the, the imagery of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, from these words today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's three great truths that come out of this text of Scripture. And the first one is going to be that all stand guilty before God. The second, that Jesus is the Lamb of God. And the third is salvation is by faith alone. So we have all are guilty. That's called universal condemnation. Jesus is the Lamb of God, speaks of our substitution, Jesus being our substitute. And salvation is by faith alone which, to use a technical term, is appropriation, how we appropriate that truth. So these three ideas, condemnation, substitution, and then appropriation. Why, why look at it from a theological perspective here this morning? There's a whole lot of drama in the text, and there are many lessons, many thoughts that could arise out of this and take up the next couple of Sundays, but I would just like us to consider this. If I were to ask you, and you were given the opportunity to explain your salvation to a fifth grader, would you be able to do it in such a manner, succinctly, that they would understand what is, uh, has to take place within their heart? In other words, being able to have a biblical explanation of what it is to be saved. 
You see, I, every once in a while I get to see, oh, well, actually I get to look at all of the applications that come in for the school. Well, Ms. Terry may look at credentials. I look at pretty much one section. Explain how you were saved. Explain your salvation. Because therein gives to me the, uh, a knowledge base of whether or not that individual uh, is invested in the scripture, understands the terms of salvation, what it actually is to be saved, and for the most part, if they are saved or not. And I'm finding as time goes by, and it's just, uh, it's, it's like I don't have all the statistical data in the world to, to prove this, other than the fact of what I read, the, the information on that, with exception, gets, gets a little bit thinner and thinner as time goes by. I trusted Jesus as my Savior, a, a one-liner. I know that Jesus lives in my heart. That's another phrase. Um, I've been washed from my sin. You know, and maybe some of the times those statements are just for the purpose of abbreviation. But yet, on the other hand, can we give a detailed explanation as to how that just, uh, justifies being saved? And that's what I want to look at. So one of the ways that I always like to present things is this. Can I clearly explain the gospel, the way of salvation, to a fifth grader? Because they're going to have all the questions, and, they, and you have to be able to answer them. You see, the foundational knowledge uh, base for the, this very important uh, idea of salvation, the found, it's so critical to us. And there's, there's reason for that. Number one, if we understand the Bible's teaching instruction on our redemption, our salvation, it provides us with a full assurance of faith. That is something that is needed, desperately needed in our lives. Because as time goes by, it becomes more difficult, and eventually when life is threatened, ministry is threatened, we have to have a full assurance of faith. And so Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 to 20, we, we read about that, whereas um, as Paul writes, and, uh, to the Hebrews in that chapter, he explains to us the fact that uh, in, in chapter 6, verses 16 to 20, we read these words. For men verily swear by the greater, an oath for confirmation is to them to end all strife, wherein God willing to be more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled to refuge to lay hope upon the hope that is set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. So one of the, the point of that is the knowledge of the details of our salvation, condemnation, substitution, appropriation, gives us a fuller assurance of our faith. It also provides us with courage and hope in other words, we could say that we are persuaded. Romans chapter 8, verses 37 to 39. And in, and in that section, we read these words. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, angels, principalities, or powers, nor things present, nor things to come, height, depth, any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when an individual is locked in and he understands why he is saved, how he got saved, how that transaction took place, now we have persuasion. That is confidence, and that is courage. That gets hope. So number one, the full assurance of faith. Number two, we have a strong co uh, courage and confidence. We are persuaded that God will never leave us nor forsake us. And the third reason is that when we can explain our salvation with conviction. You see, if we're, if we're going to win anybody to the Lord, if we're going to win a fifth grader to the Lord, your neighbor, whatever it might be, you have to be able to speak in such a way that your words are convincing. That coming from your heart is a conviction that you know that you're saved and how you got saved. So we have to kind of like do away, but let's dispense with the one-liners. Just believe in Jesus. Or the other phrase oftentimes, you just have faith. 
If you have faith, and, that, and a lot of times there's no object to that statement. There is no faith in or faith of Jesus. None of that is mentioned. So the new gospel has the language of expediency. Just believe Jesus saves. God loves you. Trust him with all your heart. My insurance guy will tell you the same thing. Just trust the numbers. The economy will stabilize. Just wane it out. Have faith. Have hope. Continue your job. All of that. It's the language of the norm. But when you get to the Bible and we talk about our salvation, we have to be able to speak with conviction. So when Peter and John are before the religious leaders, the religious leaders in Acts chapter 4 and verse 13, they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. So while they said, speak no more, we're going to cut you loose this time, they went out and they spoke more, and they were arrested again. They were put into prison. And they spoke with such conviction, they believed the knowledge of their own salvation so much that nothing could stop them. Why? Because they understood the foundation of their faith and how they got saved, what God did during that period of time. So we, the, the knowledge of condemnation, substitution, appropriation, all that, the knowledge of that gives us a full assurance, provides us with courage, hope, and a conviction in the, in the explanation of the gospel in terms of witnessing. Now, we get all this from our text out of Hebrews chapter 12, because in a, as we go through this, begin, uh, I'll just pick up on the verses as we go along. But from the, that reading that Charlie gave to us this morning, these three thoughts arise. Number one, on the subject of condemnation, all humanity is guilty before God. All of humanity is guilty before God. You see, what is interesting in the uh, chapter 12 text, the first verse. So if you go back and you were to start, let's say, like a verse, chapter 5, and you move your way forward, at the beginning of each chapter, and, Mo, and God spoke to Moses, and God spoke to Moses, and it's a repetition of that phrase. God is speaking to Moses, and he's telling him what is going to take place. When we get to chapter 12 and verse 1, and the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. Now the territory changes. It's not just Moses at Pharaoh's throne. Now he puts him in the same group. And Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. So there's something different that is going to happen just right out of the gate with verse 1. Why? Because of the inclusion of that phrase. You see, prior to this, the Israelites were, were treated as a separate community, which they were. They had their own town, their own territory called Goshen. And so everything that Moses and Aaron did, uh, speaking to Pharaoh, had to do with Pharaoh and his gods, the people and their gods. But now, with what we read, we're told that the angel of death is going to pass through the land and destroy the firstborn, and if Israel is going to find any kind of safety and deliverance, they must participate in the killing of the lamb, the application of the blood, the eating of the lamb, and staying inside. Why? Because the death angel now, in the language of the passage of chapter 12, when I pass through the land of Egypt. So now all of a sudden, Israel and Goshen are all part of Egypt. Now, historically, theologians, and for the most part, the application of the word Egypt in the Bible is a representation of the world. And so here we find uh, that the, the, uh, the Israel is in Egypt, and they are going to be condemned with the e Egyptians. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, we know that, um, first off, the Hebrews were not the best of the lot. By now, 430 years had passed since the time of Joseph. And during that 430 years, there was no word of God given to the Hebrews. During that period of time, they simply were slaves and laborers. And you can be sure 
that in an environment that is all Egypt and gods, they adopted some of that. And we know this because when they get to the Red Sea, the first thing that they say, listen, the water is too much. Moses, you brought us here to die. We told you this was going to happen. We should have stayed in Egypt. In other words, they were in love with the world. They were in love with Egypt. So part of this, when you look at it, why is God all of a sudden including Egypt because of Hebrews with Egypt? Because they were pretty much like they were. And later on, when Moses is up on the mount getting the Ten Commandments, what happens down there at sea level? They build them a golden calf. And where did they get that idea? Because they brought that with them out of Egypt. And there were the mixed multitude that was with them that would also. So they suffer from the same sin of unbelief as what Pharaoh and his people did. So this is what we mean when we say all have sinned. There is this universal condemnation that was taking place. Nine plagues were designed to attack the gods, not the people, not even Pharaoh. God was showing his miracles in destroying their belief system. But when we get to the tenth plague, the god of the firstborn, the very idol that the Egyptians worshipped, and the fact that now it's going to be against humanity, the judgment of God against humanity itself is about to take place. And so Israel is part of that condemnation. They, however, are given the way of escape by the use of the lamb, the blood, and the Passover, and all of that would have to be taken place by faith. So that leads us to Jesus as the Lamb of God. Not only do we have universal condemnation, which was then, it is now. All have sinned. There is no difference. The Bible also teaches us that every mouth is going to be stopped and the whole world is going to be guilty before God, found in Romans chapter 3 and verse 19. So all of that being said, what is the remedy? What is the way of escape? Well, in our passage of Scripture, we pick up in verse 4, And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating, to make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male the first year. Take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Keep it until the fourteenth day, the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation shall kill it in the evening. They shall take of the blood, strike it on the two doorposts, the upper doorpost of the house, wherein they shall eat. They shall eat of the flesh in the night, roast with fire, unleavened bread, bitter herbs is how they shall eat. So what is taking place here? Imagine this. You're the household father. Moses gives you the instructions. And so the, and, and the Bible tells us in chapter 12 uh, that uh, the elders of Israel and the people that were there, uh, they worshipped. They said, we're going to obey this. We're going to do this. But here's in the reality. So dad goes out the 10th day, pulls in the lamb, brings it in the household. All of the family is together with this little white lamb of the first year, all warm and cuddly. And so what he has to do, he has to lift the head, take his knife, slit his throat, and allow the, the, the blood of life to flow out of it. What's going through the man's mind when this is happening? He knows that in the background this is necessary because his life now is at risk. If the death angel comes in and does not see the blood, if it does not see the blood, he's going to face the same judgment as all the other firstborn of Egypt. And so there would be a, soon a quick realization the blood of this lamb, his life for mine. You see what's happening? That's called substitution. The blood of an innocent, white, pure lamb, spotless, tested for four days to make sure that it was healthy. The details of it are given to us. And as the animal would bleed out and the life would dispense, it would be in exchange for the life of the sacrificer the household, the individuals, the participants. And they would participate also by the eating of that lamb as it would be roasted with fire. Any one of the family members could say, you know, this is ridiculous. What is the point of killing a lamb? 
How will that rescue us? You see, those were the legitimate questions. But they acted out of faith, and they soon realized that here is a substitutionary death of one that is innocent, so that the sinner, the guilty one, condemned, which Israel was, they were under the condemnation of God with Egypt, so that that condemned individual family could live. Now, you're seasoned saint. You know your Bible. But let me refresh your memory, because part of the problem that I think we, we face today is not being able to really textually explain what does the Bible mean by a substitute. See, this is a whole lot different than just believe, trust Jesus, come to know him, let Jesus come into your heart. So those words, they don't speak of condemnation. They don't speak of substitution. They uh, lead us to the idea of, of faith and belief, but in what? So when we look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19, the, the section that we just write now is a type of the reality, the substance, the type of Christ. And John the Baptist is in the Jordan River in John chapter 1 and verse 29. As Jesus walks up to him, what were his words? Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist no doubt was thinking about Exodus chapter 12, the lamb, the Passover lamb, that would bring deliverance to a condemned people. Equal condemnation, universal sin, and their way of escape was going to be by the death of that one lamb. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 19, Jesus' precious blood as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So Jesus becomes that perfect Lamb of God that we read about in the Exodus passage. The substitute for Israel was the death of the Lamb. The substitute for us as believers, for every individual that wants to come to know Jesus Christ, to be saved or the rescued, is to realize that there's nothing that they're going to be able to do on their own. There's no merit in their good works. It's strictly accepting and receiving the fact, Jesus died in my place. So the condemnation that should have been upon ourselves was placed upon him. He that knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The lamb who knew no sin, the lamb who had no idea that there's a contest between God and Pharaoh, who knew nothing finds himself on the altar as the innocent one, not knowing that his death was going to be the substitution to prevent the death of an entire nation of people or anybody that refused to believe it. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. So these are texts that you want to, they're probably the most prominent text that talks about, you know why I know I'm a believer? Because Jesus died in my place. Where I was, I was a sinner. He was the perfect one, the innocent Lamb of God. And so he took my sin and put it upon himself. He who in himself bore our sins upon his body, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. That comes from Peter. He described, actually he's trying to teach people how to be good servants, and refers them to the redemptive work, the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. So he pulls that aspect of substitution out of the library of theology, making the application to, to how to be a, a servant to the cruel kings. But as he uses this, we see the language of on his own body, our sin, on himself. We were dead so that now we are alive by whose stripes, his suffering, we are healed. Jesus is the Lamb of God. All humanity is guilty before God. Jesus is the Lamb of God. And the third part is this, so we go from condemnation to substitution, now we look at appropriation. Salvation is an individual act of faith. And this is where we can run, really run into problems. Too much knowledge can be dangerous. Too much knowledge of the Bible 
can be dangerous to the salvation of one's soul. By that I mean this, we live in an age of philosophy and trends and ideologies, uh, groups and ideas that we hang. Everything is given a political label or worldview label, and that helps us to identify the way people think. And some people will identify with Christianity, conservatism, the right wing, uh, movement, Tea Party, what have you, because it represents high moral values. That is not redemption. That is not salvation. Salvation for the Israelite back in that day, he had to appropriate his faith to that which God gave to him. Let me simplify this for you. The matter was a personal one. And so when Moses gave the instructions to the leaders, he says, here's what you do. The lamb, kill it, put the blood um, on the doorpost, eat it, burn it, wait for morning. The death angel will pass over you. Those were truth statements. That's all that was, truth statements. What was necessary? Every Israelite would have to appropriate that truth by faith to his own heart. In other words, he could have heard the words, it is possible, it is very possible, that they could have gone through the actions, they could have gone through the motions, kill the lamb, put the blood up, sit back, let's see if this works. They could have done that. And the firstborn, the judgment would have come in. Why? Because it was not attached with faith. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 28 gives us this. Through faith, Moses kept the Passover. So the first right out of the gate on this, by faith, Moses kept the Passover. Moses instructed the Israelites, and they also would keep the Passover by faith. We call this the obedience of faith. Truth without faith is dead. It will get an individual nowhere. There, for, let me give you an illustration. We oftentimes have the sinner's prayer. Now, I'm not opposed to that. Here's the opposition. Here's where we have to be careful. If we're, if we're not careful, the, an individual can say the prayer and think that those words merit redemption. In other words, if it's not a prayer of faith, it is not saving faith. There is no saving benefit. An Israelite could go kill the lamb, put the blood up and all that, but not be rescued. Why? Because if it's not attached to faith, if there's no obedience in faith, you see, truth itself does not save. The knowledge of the Word of God, if you're here today and you, you've just been rich in Scripture, but you've never appropriated the benefits of Christ's substitutionary death to your life in a prayer of faith, I believe, I trust, I'm repenting, I surrender my life, and I put it into the care of my Savior that he will keep me, then there is no saving faith. That is the great danger that we face today. You see, God was just asking the people in the simplicity of faith, do the sacrifice and believe that the death angel will pass over. There's an interesting observation that comes out of this before we close, and that is the, the use of the hyssop tree. It's just a common bush that actually would grow out of the walls of, of, of Egypt and the pile of rocks, kind of like some plants just grow out of coral. It's available everywhere, almost like, uh, uh, you know, uh, avocado trees. They, they just grow over the seed falls. God used that to help the Israelites understand there's nothing elaborate about this. The common branch that is available to anybody can be used in that appropriation of your faith. You didn't have to go buy it. It was there. It was in their possession. It was at their right hand and at their left hand. And so the truth needs to be followed through with the obedience of faith. 
it's a, it's a case of we simply trust him. Why? We're all sinners. The need of salvation. God provided the way through the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. And then we take that knowledge, we take that truth, appropriate it to yourself. I believe, I trust, because God said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, with the mouth confession is made in salvation, and with the heart man believes unto righteousness. The words and the heart come together with truth and faith. Condemned, rescued by substitution, and appropriate the truth by faith. I pray that all of us in this auditorium here today, we understand the God's language of salvation. If you are saved and you know that, let this be the refresher course. Now I have a better understanding of what it is to be a Christian. And it gives us something to build on, assurance, courage, boldness of faith. That's very important. And it, it could be that you understand it, and that's good. But I just want us to be able to have that blessed assurance that Jesus is mine so that you can leave here today having that full persuasion. I know whom I have believed through Jesus Christ. So, Father, we pray that these words of the Scripture, the lesson that you give to us, as it points to Jesus, here we are today, we look to him for our redemption, our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.